Ladies and gentlemen, Hebrews and Shebrews, welcome to the Life Podcast. Today's episode is an emergency because there is a disaster in Tennessee and Carolinas, and you can go in real life, IRL, and help people on the ground right now with Grindstone Ministries. So we're talking with TJ Morris from Bear Independent, also from Grindstone Ministries. What they do is they go into these situations and they clean up the mess. And then they also help intercede with people and, and, and put people back together emotionally and spiritually as well, a little bit. If you want to help, go to grindstoneministries.com or just go to the FOB, the forward operating base. I didn't even know what that was until this interview. And there's a location in this description where you can rendezvous with the Grindstone team. The whole impetus behind what they are doing and why maybe you should go is to love your neighbor as yourself and to take care of the least of these. That's what's moving these guys to go and leave their comfortable lives and their, and their air conditioning or their heating and go to sleep on cots and maybe eat stale bread. But they're there to help other people, help their neighbors. So Bear's going to walk us through all that, and he's going to talk to us about what Grindstone Ministries does, how it was formed, some of the miracles that he's witnessed in, in doing this work, and about a future part of what he envisions for this ministry. So without further ado, I give you Bear. Bear, thank you so much for being on the live podcast again and in a state of emergency. <laughs> thank you for having me, brother. I'm, I'm honored and blessed to be here. Uh, cause you know, you rock your audience rocks and uh, I've said it before, but I'll say it again. I don't even think you are aware of the impact you have had for the kingdom and for Messiah from all the people, the lives that you have touched through the work that you do. You're an awesome brother and it's an honor. So thank you. Oh, thank you, sir. And same to you though, man, same to you. And I, that's what we're here to talk about today is like, wow. What the impact you're currently having right now uh, across the United States and specifically Grindstone? Do you want to put us in your shoes? <laughs> <laughs> so they're they're very large. They're thirteen triple E. So I'm a, I wish you the best of luck here. Um, so Grindstone is our first five hundred one c three. Uh, we're a nationally federally registered uh, disaster relief organization, nonprofit. We have the same authority as the American Red Cross, which means more or less we get to go wherever we want and do whatever we want. And that's awesome. What we want to do is make the father smile by being his hands and feet and loving our neighbor as ourself. And so Grindstone is currently deployed. This is our 46th deployment in five years. And we are in eastern Tennessee. Um, so Hurricane Helene came in from the Gulf and it, it hit Florida and then it hit Georgia and then she just kept going, bro. And in Eastern North Carolina, no, I'm sorry, Western North Carolina and Eastern Tennessee, there are entire swaths of, of areas where towns have been wiped off the map. Like they're gone. Um, the infrastructure is gone. The search and rescue is ongoing. Grindstone in Eastern Tennessee, we're, we're one of two 501, 501c3s approved by the state of Tennessee at the state level for operations in Tennessee, which is good because that gives us authority with the county and local emergency management teams. We're, we are there to help. Uh, we're not there to argue with anybody. We don't have to get into any jurisdictional pissing contest with anybody. We're just there to help. Uh, one county of the three, we've been given three counties, one county, there are 70 grid squares in that county. We have searched 27 of them so far, just to give you an idea of the enormity of the situation. So we're about a third done in one county of the three. And, um, this is not me prophesying, but I firmly believe that the casualties will be me measured in hundreds or thousands. Um, they are fine. Our, our teams are finding bodies in trees, 30 to 50 feet up. There are pickup trucks and tractors and cattle in the treetops 
from where the water came through. The high water line in some places as high as 50 feet up. And so it's absolutely devastating for a region that didn't have a lot of resources to deploy against something like this in the first place. And that this is literally unprecedented flooding. This has never happened there before. There's no map sheet for this. And it's complete and utter chaos. Um, you know, since Shabbat morning, um, we have been, as have many others, have been orchestrating uh, hundreds of aerial assets, fixed wing, rotor wing, so planes and helicopter, aerial assets, flying in and around eastern Tennessee, western North Carolina to get people out because many communities, many areas became islands. There's no way in or out. They're surrounded by water. Houses and hospitals and fire departments completely underwater, people on rooftops, and then in some cases the water came up over the rooftops and they were they were lost. But moving moving helicopters in to get people out and then sling loading supplies to the people that are isolated until they can get out because there's so many people, there's not enough aircraft to go around. And some of the I can't even tell you who some of these people are. But just say that there's some people who wear some uniforms that didn't wait for permission to do the right thing, just started doing the right thing. And it's humbling and amazing that they reached out to us. And they're like, hey, we're at your service, which means you're at the service of Elohim. We're at your service. What do you need us to do? It's like, go rescue people. Awesome. What do we do with them after we rescue them? I don't know. We're going to figure it out. Get them to someplace safe and dry at a higher elevation, then we'll figure out next steps from there. In the one community outside of Jonesboro, Tennessee, which is where Grindstone is currently based out of, uh, Jonesboro, Tennessee, the FOB for everybody listening is at 104 Cherry Grove Road in Jonesboro, Tennessee. 104 Cherry Grove Road, Jonesboro, Tennessee. If you want to donate your time, you want to donate supplies, you want to whatever, come see us. You're going to have a very hard time getting a hold of anybody there because there's no cell service. First net for first responders is down. Verizon isn't working. Um, you know, we are moving in um, Starlinks and Starlink roams into the area to start to get a Wi-Fi mesh network set up. Uh, there's one frequency that still has a repeater working for UHF, VHF. It's Camo's terrible, but in that our little the little township of Jonesboro, Tennessee, we have more than five thousand displaced people right there, just in Jonesboro, and so we've been pulling people out. We've been orchestrating supplies. We're working on thirty thousand cases of water. That's ten thousand cases per county that we've got under Grindstone's purview currently, and that's about three days worth of water currently. Um, and so the situation is dire, but it's also uh, a phenomenally beautiful opportunity to just see exactly how big our Elohim is. And it, it's, bro, it's going to make me tear up. The number of people that have just come out of the woodwork to volunteer their time. We've been doing this for what, eight minutes we've been recording I can see on this other tab I've got open on my uh, computer right here, I've gotten 14 more emails in the Grindstone inbox of people looking to volunteer and donate in eight minutes. And I'm a zero inbox guy. So I've been, <laughs> I've been pulling my hair out <laughs> for three days. Let's say someone has never heard of this ministry. They don't know, but they heard the address you just told them. In the email you sent out to everyone, um, you went over what they need to bring can you just, anything that you remember from that list, can you tell them, like, maybe the most important things? And what's FOB for those, you know, people? Uh, forward operating base. So that's like... Um, the rendezvous point. Yeah, it's, it's kind of out there, out there in the stuff, right? And so, like, we're taking, like, bulk unitized donations, a.k.a. like semi loads of a single thing, like a semi load of water, a semi load of feminine hygiene products, a semi load of wool blankets, uh, whatever it might be. That's going to the Crossroads Christian Church in Gray, Tennessee, Crossroads Christians Church in Gray, Tennessee, unitized semi loads or box truck loads go there. 
mixed loads, individual loads, volunteers, uh, salt teams, heavy equipment, fuel, everything else goes to 104 Cherry Grove Road, Jonesboro, Tennessee. That's where the fob is at. We have the ability, praise the most high, to sleep up to 100 volunteers at this location. We do have Wi-Fi up there. We do have electricity there. And because we have electricity there, we have hot water and 12 showers, one for each tribe of Israel. This is amazing. So, uh, you know, Naftali, you shower over there. Is a car you're over here. Gad, I, I don't know. Pick one. Okay. Uh, so uh, we've been we've been blessed with an excellent forward operating base, and that's where volunteers need to go to. Now, what do, what do they need to bring with them? Um, so if you're going to show up to site, and I would encourage you to show up to site, um, we our immediate need are individuals and or teams that are rotating in for seven to 10 days at a time. If you can only come for three, come for three. Okay. We are anticipating that grindstone is going to be on site for a minimum of 30 days, possibly up to 90 days. We need logistics personnel. We need saw teams. We need saw teams like the Dickens, bro, like people that really know how to run chainsaws. This is not the, I, well, I have one. I'm not really sure how to use it. Like you come see us in a month and I'll teach you. But right now we need professionals, people that know how to run chainsaws. We need medical personnel, heavy equipment operators and heavy equipment, but not too heavy. Uh, skid steers with grapples, track hose with thumbs, um, and the means to convey them to site. But all of the current roadways that are open max out at 40 ton weight rating. So I would love to have D6 high track dozers and D8s and, and you know giant 50 ton track hose because we have hundreds of thousands of tons of debris and mud to move, but the existing infrastructure couldn't handle it before the storm and it's all been weakened since the storm. So we need to start with our smaller stuff first, skid steers, preferably tracked skid steers with grapples, track hose with thumbs. We need truck drivers and trucks to drive, dump trucks and dumps, um, dump trailers, etc. Search and rescue personnel, communications experts, community liaisons and general laborers, what we call hands and feet. If you don't know how to do any of that, but you got a strong back and a pair of work gloves, we need you too, okay? Um, and then we need, uh, we need water. We need water like woe. Um, four by four pickup trucks side-by-sides, and then logistics trucks for strike teams so we can load up supplies from our FOB and then go out into the communities that are still isolated or still hit, where there's still residents located, and bring them food, bring them water, bring them warming items, shelter, hygiene products, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> we need bulk fuel. We need fueling tanks, fueling equipment. We also need... Tons, literal, of non-perishable food supplies and meat, all of which is according to Leviticus 11. We keep kosher, okay? Um, and that's non -negosh. Um, And then what should you bring with you? Your everyday carry items, whatever you EDC, your concealed carry permit if applicable, uh, phones, charged battery packs, charging cables and charging stations, wipes, toilet paper, hand sanitizer, a minimum of one full tank of fuel for your POV, your personally owned vehicle, so that you can get back out of there again. That's your fuel to get back out of there again because the whole place has been smashed. Uh, seven to ten days worth of work clothes, toiletries, towel, extra socks, food and water to self-support for seven to ten days. UHF, VHF radios, chargers and batteries. An individual first aid kit with a tourniquet preferably worn on your body, uh, oral rehydration salts, two pairs of sturdy footwear, one to wear, one to dry out because we're dealing with mud and flooding here, uh, shower shoes or flip-flops or whatever to wear around the fob, a sleep kit, so a cot, ground pad, air mattress, sleeping bag, pillow, wool blanket, wooby, whatever you're into, notebook, pens, pencils, sharpies, uh, PPE, Personal protective equipment, safety vest, ear pro, eye pro, sturdy gloves, hard hat, logging helmet, whatever. A flashlight and a headlamp with a minimum of two spare sets of batteries. 
any OTC or prescription medications you may need for as long as you're going to be there. Your Bible, a uh, some swimwear because uh, spontaneous baptisms have been known to happen on grindstone deployments. Uh, we go where the spirit leads, and you, know, you might be getting baptized in mud on this one because that's what we got. But we've used cattle troughs. I've used a coffee pot from a Holiday Inn hotel room. Like we'll, you know, we'll do what we got to do. The last time I saw you, we were using the cattle trough at the Ruckus. Right. And 42 people got baptized and then uh, maps in and out. You should have like a road atlas. And if you have a handheld GPS and a compass, you should bring those because uh, it's a it's a disaster zone. We have three counties of an area that includes five states. And so it's a big deal. Uh, and all of that stuff is listed at grindstone ministries dot com grindstoneministries.com and you can email us at admin at grindstoneministries.com because we also have a list of items that we're soliciting for for the people the 5,000 plus people affected in the community and I'd be happy to provide that list to anybody who can just shoot me an email admin at grindstone ministries will send that out to you Wow. And so that FOB, the roads are okay to get there. It's not like they're going to have to go off road to get there no you can get there it's not going to be quick i mean in some places like one half of the road is still covered with mudslide so it's down to one lane um i would also tell you like first of all if you're going to come to play with grindstone pray over that first and make sure in the spirit that's what the father wants you to be doing um we need we need superheroes of israel right now like just facts we do but we are not the only people who are in need. We're not the only people who are dealing with this. So go where the Father tells you to go, not where I tell you to go. And I want to be really clear on that. Um, you are not allowed to operate counter to the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. And if the Spirit's telling you to go somewhere else and do something else, you go do that. Like, we will get what we need because our Elohim is God, right? Like, He's in charge of everything. So... Pray over it first before you come and make sure that you're operating in the spirit when you do. And then prepare yourself when you get there because this is devastation. This looks like a carpet bombing campaign has taken place in this area. It's completely wiped. En entire areas of the map are completely wiped. Um, towns that used to exist are no longer there. It it's... We've been doing this. This is our 46th deployment, and this is the worst we've ever seen. And we've seen my, I started doing disaster relief at Hurricane Katrina almost 20 years ago. That was the first time I saw devastation. And this, bro, it's like Sodom and Gomorrah. It's just whoosh, wiped. Yeah, it's rough. This episode of the Life Podcast is brought to you by The Way Documentary, The Truth, Reformation 2.0 Apologetics Book, and Truth Tracks. The Way documentary tells the story of our movement. This is the story of people who were trading Easter ham for Passover lamb and Sunday church for Saturday Sabbath, all in an effort to live like their savior. It dives into their stories through their own voices and into the history and theology that show how the church got to where it is today. The Truth, Reformation 2.0 is the only book of its kind, an all-encompassing theological treatise that answers every question a mainstream Christian might have about why you want to keep Torah. And finally, Truth Tracks are small comics beautifully illustrated that use stories and scripture to remind Christians that once we are saved by grace through faith, we are called to live and do the instructions of Yah, His Torah. If you want to learn more about any of these products, go to thewaydoc.com. That's the way, D-O-C, like documentary, dot com. If, if we can step back from this situation for a second, or can we use this as an example like of how Grindstone operates? Let's say there's devastation like there is. Can you walk us through how Grindstone reacts to that step by step like you already knew this was coming but you didn't know it would be this big i think right and so you were starting to prepare what do you do so um grindstone has a board of directors 
All right, we're again nationally registered 501c3 not for profit. So we have a board of directors of which I'm the president of Gravenstone. So I'm the chief executive of Grindstone, but we have a board of directors. And so when we see a potential threat, we're always tracking potential threats hurricanes, tornadoes. Um, Ryan Hall, y'all, is a YouTuber, right? And like my blood pressure goes up when Ryan Hall goes live. I'm like, oh no, here it goes, right? And so. And so when we're tracking threats and when there's a possible deployment for grindstone, meaning that uh, an area has been affected, then we go to the board and we say, hey, are, are we up is the question. Up means are we going? And it does not require unanimous consent legally per our bylaws. It requires a majority. However, because we all respect and love one another, it's always unanimous because if somebody on the board flow, throws a flag on the play i want to know what they're thinking what they're feeling and these these are all people of deep faith they're all in the same faith as us and so we're all operating in the spirit and so we come to a consensus as a board then we send out recon that's the first thing we do is we usually put out two trucks with usually two to four people in them to go see go put your eyes on it and then report back what you're seeing while they're doing recon, they will locate a place f to use as a FOB, a forward operating base. And then that's got to have certain uh, characteristics, right? I need the ability to sleep people out of the weather. I need the ability to park vehicles and equipment. I need the ability to control access and egress from a security standpoint because looting is a big deal in a lot of these places. And then ideally... Uh, we can either provide our own power generation or the power is still on there. And ideally, there's water running. If not, we can provide our own water and make the water run there. Because i got to have the ability to sleep people and feed people and park equipment and people at this site. So once we have a FOB established, then the next thing we do is we put out what's called an op order, operational order. Because now I have an address that I can address people to. And then we use our Grindstone email list. You know, it's very important you sign up for the email list at Grindstone. We don't spam you. We don't solicit. We're not asking for donations. That's just, that's how we combo with our people is via the email list. I will put together the op board, uh, who, what, when, where, why, how, be in this place at this time, bring these things, expect this. Here's the situation on the ground. Here's our priorities. Here's the stuff that we need. I need you to bring with you. Here's the stuff that the community needs, et cetera, et cetera. That goes out in an op board, and then people start rolling in. We usually get responses to that email that say, hey, this is Bill in Jackson, Tennessee, and I'm coming, and I'm bringing three guys with me and a skid steer and some chainsaws. Awesome. That's a saw team. And then on the back end, we, start, we have a, um, a spreadsheet that we use kind of like a, like a Gantt chart that basically is overlapping timelines of who's going to be where, when. And I can see the gaps that we're going to have in our personnel. Like maybe we have saw teams, but we don't have logistics personnel. Or we, we need a med person or we need medics during this time. And then we can kind of onesie twosie go out to uh, the grindstone people and say, hey, we need, a, we need a doctor or we need a nurse or we need an EMT for this time or it's looking like in two weeks we're going to need more heavy equipment because the equipment that we have is rotating out and going home who wants to bring more and then very specifically what we look for with grindstone our targets as we call them are the people who were barely getting by before the storm who last week they didn't know how they were going to buy groceries and this week literally have nothing and my my heart breaks for everybody but if you're doing okay in life, you've got some insurance, if there's, you know, you lost part of your roof, but your house is still there and insurance is going to handle it and, you know, you're going to spend a few weeks at the Holiday Inn, but it's going to be okay, I'll help you. I have nothing against helping you, but you are not our ideal candidate. Our ideal candidate are the people who had no idea how they were going to get through last week and this week they have nothing. And that's who we look for. We are 100% pro bono. We don't take a dime from the homeowner. We don't take a dime from the municipality. We don't take a dime from the state government. And we don't take a dime from the federal government. And there are a lot of 501c3s out there. Nonprofit does not mean that they don't have revenue. 
And the way that they fund themselves, we don't do this, but the way that they fund themselves is, Luke, they solicit you to come and volunteer your time. And you do. And you think you're doing a good thing. And you are. But what they don't tell you is that there's a form from FEMA that that organization is filling out with your name and the number of hours that you were on site. And they want to get as many people out there volunteering as they can because that form every hour of every day that they have somebody air quote on site, they bill FEMA for that. And so you're volunteering your time, but you're actually putting U.S. taxpayer dollars through the Federal Emergency Management Agency into that organization without them telling you about it. And that is unequal weights and measures. That's bearing false witness, and we don't do that. So we don't bill FEMA for our time, and we also don't solicit your time and your donations and then you know, on the front end and then on the back end go over here and bill the government for it. And what that allows us to do is we are beholden to no man. I don't care what FEMA thinks or the Emergency Management Association of the state or the county thinks. I'm here to help. And because I have national authority, I'm federally registered, I can basically do whatever the hell I want to do. And what I want to do is love people, help people, and make my creator smile. That's what I want to do. Not get a thousand people out here that don't know what they're doing so that I can bill, you know, 10,000 hours a day back to FEMA at 22 bucks an hour. Oh, well, guys, we made a quarter million dollars today, but we didn't do anything. We didn't help anybody. It's not about turning a profit. It's not about revenue. It's about being the hands and feet. And we have gotten everything we need and most of what we want every single time we've ever deployed with Grindstone because our God is God. I don't, I don't worship the federal government. I worship Elohim. Wow. My gosh. How did you, why, why did you start Grindstone in the beginning? What, what's the mission? What's the mission? I mean, I see what you're doing, so I guess I see the mission already. But. Yeah. So forsake not the widow and the orphan, love your neighbor as yourself, right? Um, five years ago, Hurricane Michael hit uh, Panama City, Florida. And um, I was, uh, the months later, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing that happened on the news. Wow, that sucks. Okay. And I had done some disaster contracting as a FEMA contractor during Katrina. And I hated it because government, right? Like it just was completely inefficient. Um, it, it was horrendous. You know, the prime contractor for hauling debris was getting $105 per cubic yard of debris, which is excellent federal money. That's a lot of money. You know, you're talking an average dump truck has got 18 yards on it. So it's 1800 bucks a load, a big semi, you're talking $5,000 a load prime contractor, but the prime contractor subs it out to a sub, to a sub, to a sub, to a sub. By the time it got to us, the people actually doing the work on the ground, we were getting paid six bucks a yard for C and D construction and demolition debris and a dollar fifty a yard for vegetative, which is trees. Instead of that's that's literally one percent of a hundred and five dollars. Ninety nine percent of that money had been eaten up by the prime contractor and the top subs. And the people actually doing the work were literally getting 1% of the money. And I was like, this is ridiculous. We're n I'm never doing this again. Well, not like that, I'm not. And so Hurricane uh, Michael hits Panama City, Florida. And I got a phone call. I actually got an email from a guy named the, the Reverend Gilbert Abreu at Night Runners Mobile Crisis Response. He and his wife, Evelyn, are they're literally in Western North Carolina right now. They're another great organization to support, Night Runners Mobile Crisis Response. And uh, the Reverend sent me an email, and he said, Bear, we need help. Uh, call me if you can. So I called him. I said, how can I help you? I spent five minutes on the phone with him. A minute and a half was me praying for him. Another minute and a half was him praying for me. And two minutes was like, Rev, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm coming. I don't know what we're going to do, but I'm coming. And I made a YouTube video and I said, hey, guys, I'm going to go to Florida. We're going to help these people. If you want to donate, here's a little link. We raised $3,000. We rented a minivan, filled it full of food, 
because at the time my vehicle wasn't going to make it to Florida and back. Filled it full of food, raised $3,000, drove 3,000 miles round trip. There was me and 32 volunteers, 33 people there. We fed 3,000 meals in three days, drove home, and still had $3,000 in the bank, miraculously. Even though I spent every dime of it. Loaves and fishes, bro. And I was like, I think I'm hooked. And so I come back and I'm, you know, I'm at assembly that weekend. It's on Shabbat. And we're all reading the word together. And the pastor's like, uh, you know, Pastor Joe Fox at Shofar Mountain. He's like, how was Florida? And I'm, I'm like, you know me. I'm a big, tough guy, right? I got tats and a beard. And I said four-letter words. And I'm weeping. I'm just like pfft, melting. I was like, it was amazing. And the spirit was moving. And it was so good. And um, one of my brothers comes up to me and he goes, hey, man. That Florida stuff you're doing sounds awesome. If you go back, I want to go back. And I was like, yeah, we're going. In the moment, I'm like, we're going back. He's like, cool, when? I was like, I don't know. I just decided we're going back. And so a few weeks later, we went back. And it was literally literally twice as many people. Uh, we were there for six days. There were 66 people there. And it just kept multiplying. Um, I'll tell you something, like, insane. Absolutely insane. Uh, we had our fob. It was a half destroyed church. Like uh, one half of the church was like missing, destroyed. Um, and in the sanctuary, it was weird, right? Uh, there was no power to the building. And But one of my guys comes to me and he's like, uh, Mr. Bear, the lights are going off in the sanctuary. And I'm like, there's not even a meter in the in the meter can. There's no There's no power lines run to the building. There's no generator running. What's up? So I go in there. And I'm looking, and it's Florida in the summer. It's like 98 degrees outside, and it's cold in the sanctuary. Like, can see your breath cold. And these lights are blinking off and on, and I can feel it. Oh, there's an unclean thing in this room. Okay. Well, another one of my guys comes up behind me. He goes, did you call me? I said, uh, no. He goes, I distinctly heard your voice saying, come to me. I was like, Okay. He goes, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm not really sure. And then one, another brother, right? In the mouths of two or three, let a thing be established. Another brother comes running up behind me and goes, what are we doing? He was like, I don't know. He goes, well, I heard you calling for me. I was like, no, I didn't say anything. He goes, you called me. You called my voice. I heard you. It's like, mm -mm, wasn't me. And uh, now things are getting thrown across the room. It's like, whoosh, whoosh. Lights are blinking the whole nine. You can, we can see our breath. It's that cold inside of the sanctuary. And we just all looked at each other and just started knife hand rebuking stuff all around the sanctuary until we got it down to one, one foot square floor tile. It's right here. And the three of us were praying over this thing, rebuking this thing until the lights stopped flickering, the heaviness in the room raised off of it. It got hot in the room again. It wasn't cold anymore. I was like, um, well, that was crazy. Okay, there's power in the name of Yeshua. The next day, I'm out cutting. There was this house that had like three dozen gigantic pine trees, like pickup sticks right over the top of it that had uh, a husband, a wife, and two little babies living in it. And not one of the trees miraculously was touching the house. But if you cut any one tree wrong, they would all collapse on top of the house and smash it. And so I'm out there like, please, Father, give me wisdom through the Spirit. How the heck are we going to do this, right? I looked at it for an hour. And for those that don't know, my first company, you know, I started my first company at 17, cutting timber in upstate New York. And then I got into doing technical tree removals. And, and so like, I know my way around a chainsaw. I know some rigging. I, I know some things. I looked at this thing for an hour trying to figure out where to make the first cut, right? And so it's now about lunchtime, and uh, this storm starts blowing in. There's another big tropical storm coming, and I get sugar cookied because I'm getting rained on. I'm soaking wet. I'm covered in sawdust, and I'm getting pissed. I'm like, you got to be kidding me, man. We come all the way over here to Florida to help fix this problem, and now here comes another storm. Hey, mind you, this was five months after the original hurricane, 
and it still looked like a disaster zone because the federal government is not coming to save you. That's why you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. It's our job to be charitable to each other, not to subsidize that with the federal government, not to take that purview and abdicate it and give it away to somebody else to do it on our behalf. It's our job to love our neighbor as ourself. And so I'm getting furious because I'm like, I'm out here trying to help people. And here comes another storm. And so then now there's lightning and thunder. And my guys are like, come on, boss, we got to go back to the fob. You're going to get hit by a lightning and you're going to die. And you know, we got to go home. And I'm like, okay. So I get in the truck, soaking wet, covered with sawdust. And I come driving up to the fob. And the only good thing FEMA had ever given me, there's a 20 foot wide, 40 foot long, big, like canopy tent structure thing. And we had lined that up with folding tables where groceries and food would come in palletized on one end. And then we would bag it all up to where we had individual portions and household portions on the other end, load that onto trailers and do what we call strike teams, where we would go out into the community and distribute that to each individual person or house as they needed. And so I'm watching this blow away in this storm. There are seven dudes holding onto this canopy, trying to hold it onto the ground as it's being picked up and blown away into the air. One half of it is already 20 foot off the ground. And I come sliding into a stop into the fob, throw the truck and park, get out and just start screaming at the sky, rebuking in the name of Yeshua Messiah. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just furious. And brother, as I sit here breathing, the wind stopped and that canopy Drop back down to the ground. And everywhere around us, everywhere around this fob, the trees were shaking and blowing, shingles are flying off roofs. But right here, this one square block in our half destroyed little church, it was dead silent, dead still. And I looked at the sky, and one of my guys who was still hanging onto the thing looked at me like, What the hell just happened? I was like, Hold on. I have to go weep for a few minutes. And I, w <laughs> I went around the side of the church and I just bawled like a baby, dude. I was like, all right, father. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us to like, for not wrecking our stuff so we could stay here and continue to be your hands and feet and help these people. And after that, I came home and I gathered my executive team together and I said, Hey, uh, we're going to keep doing this. And so we should probably wrap an entity around this, probably a nonprofit, because we didn't even have nonprofit status at this point. It was just the right thing to do. And so we found a Grindstone Ministries. And uh, since that time, like I said, we're in the midst of our 46th deployment right now. And it has just prospered and grown. All people of deep faith and emuna faith, belief coupled with works. Don't tell me what you believe. Show me what you believe. Come do it with us. And uh, we have hundreds of people across North America, individuals and agencies and companies that we're partnered with, all nonprofit, no money changes hands. They just have a conviction of the spirit. They come and they donate their time, whether it's a day, a week, or a month. And they just come and they give. And our whole goal is just to love on the least of these and help them. They've, they've lost every material, physical thing that they have. And I'll tell you, man, there's nothing more humbling than talking to somebody who's standing on the bare slab of where their house used to be. It was taken away in a tornado. And they have literally not another physical thing left but a, a piece of concrete. And they ha But they do have their entire family. Everybody's safe. Everybody's okay. And you hand them some food, some hot food that you prepared yourself, right? And you're like, what do you guys need? Like, we're good. You should go check on those people over there. It's like, you guys have nothing. Please let us love on you. They're like, okay. You give them a hug. You start praying with them. And then they start weeping in your arms. And they're like, why are you doing this? It's like, oh, well, let me tell you a cool little story. Um, the creator of the universe loves you individually, you so much that he convicted me in Oklahoma to come all the way out here to where you are so that I could give you this day your daily bread so we could have a conversation 
So I could just tell him how much you, I could tell you how much you mean to him. He loves you and we are here to help. And it's, it's a beautiful thing, dude. And you couple that with living at the fob stoically on like maybe a cot. And it's like, what's for dinner? Whatever, whatever we got, what are we going to do for entertainment? Go to sleep. Cause we have to work again tomorrow, you know? And it, and it's, it's just an awesome reset of the soul where you're completely dependent upon the father and he shows up and shows off every minute of every day in spite of this horrendous damage that has occurred. And it really makes you mindful of what's actually important. And it's not the two by fours and the drywall. It's not the trees that got knocked over. It's not your car that's 50 foot up in a tree now. It's your life. It's the breath that's in your lungs. It's your left and right relationships, the people that you love, the people that he's given you to steward. That's what's important. And uh, I do believe genuinely he gives people that experience so that they have no distractions anymore. It's just him and them. They can't run from him anymore. There, there's no other distractions. You're, you're all the way, like Job, you're all the way back to zero. It's like, will you worship me now? It's like, yeah, you got no choice but to worship him now. Oh, my God. It's so beautiful. <laughs> okay, okay. How, how, how do you... What's the secret, I guess, to deploying a disparate bunch of people from around the entire United States or beyond to, and, and, and coordinating them? I mean, that seems like a, a miracle in itself. It is. Um, and then it's, it's also experience and communication. Um, and there's, there's a, a selection factor as well. There's, you know, there's two kinds of people, bro. People who are going to look for reasons why they can't and people who are going to look for reasons why they can. And the people who look for reasons why they can't will always find them. And the people, and that's okay. It, that's the father can use you elsewhere. The people who look for reasons why they can, those are the kinds of people who show up at the FOB and are like, I'm here to help. Because they got an email with an address that said, bring these things, arrive. And then they do. And so, and then we have a lot of alumni with Grindstone. We have a, a lot of, they get hooked, man. You come to one and then you're like, it, it's, I don't wish bad things upon anybody. But I'd be lying if I said there haven't been times I looked at my brother and said, I am ready for a deployment. I am ready because I need that reset of the soul, right? I need to go sleep on a cot and like eat bread and go pray with people and, and operate heavy equipment and run chainsaws. And when, once you get hooked, like, you know, you see that email coming through Grindstone. You look at your wife like, babe, I'm up. I'll see you when I see you. I, I don't know. I, I'll, I'll hit you on a Zoom call in a couple of weeks. Like. I'm going. Um, and so we have a lot of alumni. Um, and then, like I said, we, we, we push out that operations order via the email. And then right now it's, it's living front page of the website, you know, where to go, what to bring, what to do, who to talk to. Um, and then people either show up or they don't. And, and if they don't, that's okay. Right. That the judgment free zone, that's okay. But a lot of people do, and all it takes is one. I mean, they, these are, they're not, they, they're not de facto on its face a, a spiritual experience, right? It's not like, you know, come to our men's retreat slash, you know, disaster relief effort. But that's what they are, you know? And, it, and it's, I had one woman, uh, Sister Cindy, I love her. She was with us in Idabel, Oklahoma, after an EF5 smashed Idabel, big tornado. And uh, we were having a really hard time getting chainsaw chains, like logistics. You know, there's all different types of sizes and shapes and designs of chainsaw chains. And we needed a specific one. And she had gotten a bunch of chainsaw chains. And I was running a steel 661 Magnum with a 32 inch bar. That's my saw and nobody could get chains to fit it. I had one chain. I'm on week three of the same chainsaw chain. And I had to sharpen this thing with a file down to little tiny nubs, right? I get back to the fob and, and 
somebody was like, Hey, there's, there's more chainsaw chains. And I'm like, praise ya. And I go looking through the chainsaw chains and they're all wrong. And I've been outside, you know, sweaty, hot, dirty for 12 hours. And I've just, I went full blown bear mode. And I just, rah, 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 what the fuck, blah, 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 blah. And I might have thrown something. I don't know, right? And I turn and look, and there's this woman over there with her head in her hands, weeping. I said, are you okay? What's, what's the matter? Are you okay? And she's like, I'm the one that bought the chainsaw chains, and I'm so sorry that I did it wrong. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm crying too now. I was like, sister, I am so sorry. Please forgive me. I am so sorry. Like, thank you for trying. It's not your fault. I shouldn't have done that. I apologize. I'm just frustrated. I am so sorry. Please, please stop crying. And then she starts crying even more. It's just like waterworks. And I'm like, and now I'm like, I don't know. I don't know how to handle this. I'm not built for that. I don't know. Do I throw something else now? I don't, what do I do? Uh, and so, and so she, she collects herself and she said, I'm not crying cause you're mad. I'm not crying cause I made a mistake. I'm crying because no man has ever apologized to me for his mistake before in my life. And I have been wronged by men severely in my life. And you don't understand how cathartic this moment is for me right now. To be around men of Elohim who will admit when they make mistakes. And I feel so safe and so protected and so loved in this moment right now. I can't explain it. I was like, okay, well, now I'm crying again. Thank you. It's, bro, it's, it's a deployment, but it's a family reunion. These are my friends. These, these are my family. We, we, have, we have a bond that is only really forged in situations like this, where we come together, we do hard things in the name of the most high, we get to be a blessing to other people, we're blessed in the process, we live austerely, there's an element of stoicism to it. And um, it's just good, clean fun for all the right reasons. And so when if you've done it once or twice, you're almost, you know, we get it's gotten to the point now, brother, when people see a big storm make landfall or they know an area has been shwacked by a tornado, I'll look at my phone and I got 200 messages from people like, hey, boss, we're up, right? We're going. We're going. Where are we going? Hey, I know we don't have a fob yet, but I'm driving that direction. You let me know where the fob is. I'm like, okay, I, I guess we're up. And so it's uh, it's very uh, grassroots, very you know, crowdfunded, crowdsourced to this whole thing. And and that's that's. That's how you know the spirit's involved, right? And the mouths of two or three let a thing be established. Well, if I got two or three hundred witnesses, like we're going, right? The answer to that is yes, we're going to go. Um, and that's why we've, we've had so many state and local emergency management agencies come to us and said, you know, most recent one was in Oklahoma. Oh, Director of Oklahoma Emergency Management up in Barnesville, Oklahoma, came to us and she said, I've been doing this for 22 years. I have never witnessed an organization like Grindstone Ministries. Every one of you is amazing. You're all squared away. You do the work that you say you're going to do. You show up on time. You actually help people. You're honest. You deal honestly with the homeowners and with the municipality. She goes, it is a blessing that you are in Oklahoma. I am so proud to know that you are in our home state. Thank you, ma'am. Because we have awesome people that show up and we're all singing from the same sheet of music. We all got the same rule book, you know, we're like, we all, we all get it. Everybody clues. It's just the best witness for like the Torah ever. That's why I'm so glad it's Torah guys going out and doing the best. That's what I want to see. I want to see it everywhere. And <laughs> especially when people are hurting. So that's why it's beautiful, man. Amen. Amen, bro. Well, it's James, right? You say you have belief. I will show you my belief by my works. And I'm no Jacob. I'm no James, right? I'm just a guy with a chainsaw. But you can serve Elohim being a guy with a chainsaw. Like the opportunities for that exist. And you're absolutely right. Your, your belief is what you do. Your life is your witness. Don't tell me how good faith is 
and Messiah is and, and adherence to the Torah is show me, show me how good that is. Because then people go, dude, I've, we've had so many conversations at the FOB because we keep Shabbat at the FOB. Sundown Friday through sundown Saturday, we're doing our weekly Sabbath. And we don't make you come to Bible study, but it's hard to avoid because we're there, right? And so we bring cases of the scriptures with us. We give them out to people, whether they're townspeople or people who are volunteering with us. And it's like, sit down, Midrash with us. Let's study the word together. We've had so many people be like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. How come nobody ever told me before? It's like, we're telling you now. They're like, you guys do this like, every day. They're like, I thought it would be like harder than this. It's like, do you feel under the burden right now? We're resting. We're in the middle of a disaster zone. And we got food, water, shelter, homies, fellowship. Like, we're beyond blessed. They're like, I, you know, and, and it's just, it's a beautiful thing to see, right? And so your witness and testimony is how you live your life. You let your light so shine forth before men, right? They should be able to see it and feel it before they ever ask you to explain it to them. Hmm. You're right. My gosh. Okay, what's the future? I won't keep you forever because I know you got to get back to it. What's the, like, what's your vision for Grindstone? Just continue keeping on? Do you have an idea of some overarching thing? Do you want to be in every single state? Do you want to leave the borders of the yeah. U.S.? So right now... We have a we operate in a 500 mile radius from our headquarters in Spiro, Oklahoma, asterisk, because we will go where the spirit tells us to go. And where we are in eastern Tennessee is 763 miles from our headquarters in Spiro. We do operate more or less nationally, but most of the work that we do is kind of in the center of the country in the breadbasket. Um, going forward, what I see with Grindstone is. Um, we want to maintain a war chest where, you know, we need to have money in reserve so that when we need to deploy, we can, we can, you know, it's just, just good business just to have cash reserves so that when there's a problem, we can immediately respond to the problem and then engage in fundraising, not the other way around. Um, we have a project right now called project Endor. Uh, you find more about that at the website and what we're trying to do is uh, get our recurring monthly donations up to the point where it will cover our maintenance and operational costs. Because when we're not deployed, we still have costs to maintain a state of readiness so that we can go be the hands and feet when we need to. Uh, where I see this thing going long term is I want to, I see starting a, a brand, for example, called Heartwood. If you know anything about trees, right? You have your sapwood and then you have your heartwood. <laughs> And the heartwoods, uh, the innermost part, picking up on the biblical concepts here, the innermost part, the heartwood, right? Well, we deal a lot with busted up trees. Everywhere we go, we're doing chainsaw stuff. And most of these trees get paid to be paid by your taxpayer dollars to be hauled off to a dump and either buried or burned. And what I would like to do is get a sawmill and a firewood processor. And I would like to be able to mill on site dimensional lumber for the rebuilding from the trees at the disaster site, right there, right there. And then also mill like slabs and finished hardwoods, moldings and things like that for sale to support heartwood, which is the rebuilding side of what grindstone does, right? Um, and then the tops of the trees, I want a firewood processor because firewood is expensive and it's labor, you know, labor intensive to produce firewood. You stick a log in one end, firewood falls out the other, do that at scale and use that to provide firewood to the people in the affected areas. And then also sell it as a gleaning over here on the profit side to create revenue for grindstone. And so that, and then all the things that come with that dump trucks and log trucks and blah, 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 blah. Um, and so we're, we're right now we're focusing on endure, you know, here is the endurance of the saints. Those that have a testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach and keep the commands. We're going to endure right now. And then once we have our, our basic needs accounted for with recurring donations, then I think it looks like implementing something like Heartwood, 
um, so that we can facilitate a the rebuilding and b create a uh, for profit vertical within the nonprofit that then adds to the sustainment because we we use our stuff like we are hard on our equipment it you know there's other ministries out there they got brand new stuff because it sits in the church parking lot when they show up to deploy man i get pissed if our stuff isn't covered with mud literally one of our kpis key performance indicators is how many hydraulic lines did we break because you only break hydraulic lines when you're using stuff and the father didn't give it to us to look at he gave it to us to use to be a blessing to his people and so because we use it my gosh do we have some maintenance expenses and so uh that's that's kind of what i see the long term being here is building out a fleet of uh, equipment and trucks to be able to maintain that constant state of readiness to then go as needed and storms are seasonal it's spring and fall mostly and so one of the things that we've unofficially done throughout the years but we're going to officially start doing is knowing that storms are seasonal spring and fall is look for grindstone deployments in the summer and the winter where we can go be a blessing to other people if there's a community that needs to be rebuilt or if there's a, a facility that needs a facelift or whatever to just to maintain that always present constant forward momentum of grindstone and then use those as training opportunities come into a low pressure environment in the summer or in the winter where it's not life and death it's not immediately in the aftermath of a catastrophe and learn learn from the people here how to operate equipment how to run chainsaws learn your the medical side the search and rescue side the logistics side learn all of that so that when fall hits and it's tornado season and hurricane season you know some stuff you can be even more of a blessing when you finally get on the ground i think that's brilliant and i love the heartwood idea that's crazy that's brilliant i love that it solves a problem and it it creates a solution double double <laughs> when i told max he's my six-year-old son i told him what you guys were doing this morning and he's like i want to work with them when i grow up what would you say to, he's only six, but what would you say to like an 18 year old or something who's like, I just heard of Grindstone. What should I do? Oh man. So first of all, good job, Max. That's amazing. Um, I think most boys and, and men are just boys, which is bigger boys, right? Boys with bills and responsibilities. Everybody loves heavy equipment. Everybody loves tractors. Like you just do. Right. And so if you're a young man out there and grindstone sounds like something that you would want to be involved in, or even an older man out there and you want to be involved in this, but you don't know anything. Cool. Well, like step one to learning is humble yourself, right? And so pour out what you think, you know, so you can receive what you don't know, then come to sight and learn it's and it's in any trade, any profession. Um, it has always served me well to find somebody who's a master at something and then sit at the feet of the master, get there early, stay late, ask good questions. Don't waste people's time. Work really hard. Just, you can't, you can't outwork somebody else's work ethic, man. If somebody else is putting in more effort than you, they're going to be hard to catch. And so put in a real legitimate effort and learn, learn as much as you can. I mean, our, our core values from refuge are right here behind me. Be humble right here make it happen stewardship loyalty lead by example right be disciplined take responsibility communicate uh build relationships always be learning be selfless and believe and i think those would serve you well and always be learning is really important identify what you don't know in humility and then build it up and then so how do you combat like uh overwhelm well just because i don't know something doesn't mean that i need to know something i don't know open heart surgery i'm probably not gonna know open heart surgery because if i need that i'll find an expert right but there's things that are that are relative to me that i take interest in that i find joy and fulfillment in that i don't know well i want to know more about those things and, and as a young man, you can draw a Venn diagram, you know, the overlapping circles, three overlapping circles, giftings, talents, and delights. And those are three different things. Giftings are, you were born with them. 
It is when Yah put you together, he built this into you. Okay, that's a gifting. Itemize what your giftings are. Then talents. Talents are skills that you have that you've developed through discipline and experience over time. Okay, so like playing the guitar is a talent. You, the, the more you do it, the better you get. Right? And some people are naturally inclined. That's a gifting. Some aren't. But either way, it takes talent, right, in order to develop that. So a talent is a skill you develop. And then last is delights. Delights is what makes your soul smile when you're doing it. Like you're just on fire when you do this thing. And itemize those three things. Giftings, inherently born with talents, skills that I developed, and delights. What makes my soul smile? And in the middle where it overlaps, that's your sweet spot. And that is where you want to operate as a man. And I'm guessing a woman. I've never been a woman, never going to be one. But uh, so I don't know. But for a man, that's where you want to operate is in that sweet spot of overlapping giftings, talents, and delights because you derive fulfillment and joy from operating inside of that. And if you can identify what that thing is, that's what you want to pour your efforts into. That's what you want to learn about. That's what you want to get better at because, you know, you'll never work a day in a life in your life if you're doing something that you really love. And so that would be my advice to anybody who sounds like grindstone's a thing that I want to do. Well, come do it. Right? The Hebrew way of learning is by doing. Come do it. Admit you don't know what you're doing. Cool. We can work with that. I've taught a lot of people chainsaws and heavy equipment on site. Sometimes out of necessity, because I can't be everywhere at one time. It's like, hey, and you start on the baby track hoe, the little tiny one. And next thing you know, you're like, I'm on a 50 ton track hoe. This thing's amazing. Yes, it is. Please don't break it. Um, but, I, you know, admit what you don't know and then learn by doing the things that you don't know. And that's that's a talent, right? So that would be my advice. Then is there anything else you want to say about this situation down there in Tennessee? Anything else people should know? Pray for those people. There are a lot of families going through some stuff right now. Uh, so pray for those people. And it is a physical situation, but it's also a spiritual situation. You know, we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and nations and spiritual wickedness in high places. And in the light of situations like this in the aftermath of situations like this there's a lot of times like a spiritual darkness that settles over the community and so keep those people in prayer and it's part of why i think it's so important that believers people deep in their faith go into those situations and literally be the light go shine your freaking light go be love in action to people to combat that um so keep those people in prayer for sure and there's not there's like no national coverage for this. You know, the White House hasn't even issued a statement on it. Uh, we're sending billions of dollars of taxpayer money overseas. And the Tennessee Emergency Management Association, uh, the state level, you know, emergency management hasn't gotten a phone call from FEMA. They, they haven't gotten a phone call. And so... If the spirit convicts and you want to assist, find a way to plug in and assist. Grindstone is one way you can do that. You can reach out to whether it's Tennessee or North Carolina or South Carolina or Georgia or Kentucky. Just if the spirit's pressing on you, ask for clarity from dad. All right, dad, what do you need me to do? And he will tell you and then be obedient to that. And if that puts you in a grindstone bucket, great. And if it doesn't, great like he's sovereign over all things like, he understands the scope of the problem much better than i do much better than you are and so pray for those people and pray for clarity on if you're supposed to be engaged and how you're supposed to be engaged and then be obedient to that that conviction of the spirit whatever it might be okay i have one more question for you just a more macro question um, you, you guys started Grindstone, you started Caleb's house, both of these things, you've done a ton more stuff, but both of those things are super important. And it's like, why weren't those things already being done? And, and where are the Torah people and the Christian people? I know that Christians have done a lot of nonprofits, but like, what is this lack of, I don't know, uh, why, why did you start these and no one else has done this? And what do you have to say uh, for... The people sitting on the bench, I suppose. 
Ah, fence sitting is dangerous, right? You don't want to be you don't want to be in that valley in between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, right? You want to be up on Mount Gerizim, getting all the blessings, right? That's being in the valley, being in between the two peaks is is dangerous. Um, that's a very dangerous place to be. Um, if we look throughout the word, it's a constant sifting and separating, constantly sifting and separating between do you love me or do you not love me? If you love me, keep my commands. Okay. Well, what are the two prime directives from Messiah? Love the Lord your God, Yahuwah your Elohim, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Copy that. In other words, be obedient. Okay. And love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. And then people will ask, well, Bear, who's my neighbor? And here's my question. Why are you looking for an out? Why are you looking to define who my neighbor is? What is it in your heart that's saying, well, maybe there's a reason why I don't have to love this guy over here. He's not actually my neighbor. I get it. Okay. So I don't, I've never been uh, capable of fence sitting. I'm a on or off, black or white, up or down, left or right kind of guy, go or no go kind of guy. Um, and, and so myself personally, I can't, dude, I've been classically diagnosed as a workaholic by three different head docs. Okay. Like I'm gonna do stuff and it's just a, like, it's just a matter of time before I start doing something else too. And that's okay, right? I'm going to do stuff and praise the most high. He has redeemed me and given me a good set of instructions on how to do stuff righteously. So you, you should do things. Do, emuna, faith is belief combined with works. Go read the book of James, okay? And understand that James was probably the d -K, which was the earliest book of worship for earlier believers in Messiah, 62 AD. It's all about do tactical, practical, go do, do this, don't do that, tracking. So, and then as far as why aren't there more Torah observant ministries doing stuff? I, I don't know. And is it that they, they're not doing stuff or that they're not good at getting the word out? You know, because maybe there are other ministries out there that are doing stuff. And we just don't know about it, you know? And I'm in a really weird position, brother, where I got accidentally famous on the internet. And I was just, I was doing, I was going to do stuff whether I was famous on the internet or not. I just also now have a camera and a microphone where I get the opportunity to talk about the stuff that I'm doing. And so, you know, just because we don't know about it doesn't mean that it, it isn't happening. And maybe in a certain sense, you know, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing because Elohim knows and Elohim is rewarding them, whatever it is that they're doing. But it does seem, all that being said, it does seem that when it comes to Torah observance, there's more of an inward focus than there is an outward focus by and large by believers in the faith. And that is the opposite of what Messiah taught us to do. That is not what he, he did not tell us to hang out in our house and quibble over which calendar we're going to use. He told us to go out there and be the light, go forth and, and bring the good news to all nations, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, if a house doesn't receive you, knock the dust off your feet, move on to the next one. Cool. But go out there. That implies you're going from house to house. If you look at, read the gospels. Yeshua was constantly on the move. He's up in Galilee. No, he's over in Shomeron. Hey, he's in Jerusalem again. He's going over here to Beit El. The dude was constantly moving. And 1 Peter 2.21, For this you are called that Messiah, having suffered for your sins, that you will walk in his steps. What did he do? He was constantly moving around the battle space, healing people, teaching, preaching, loving on people, rebuking those when necessary, flipping tables as needed, observing the feasts, breaking bread with people. That guy moved constantly. Do stuff. And so I don't know why the Torah movement seems to be very inwardly focused, but I don't think it should be. I think it should be more outwardly focused, admitting that, yeah, we are there problems in the Torah community? Of course, because it's made up of people and people have problems. The problem is when we make problems out of people problems in the Torah community, because none of us is Messiah and we're never going to be. 
We're broken, busted up people just like every other denomination and every other religion. The difference is we have the creator of the universe made flesh who taught us how to live and walk it out for us and paid for all of that bull crap. It's not supposed to matter anymore. And we're over here fighting about the dumbest crap on planet Earth, inwardly focused, instead of going, you know what, none of that matters. What you guys need is to go sleep on a cot somewhere in a place that has no heating, ventilation, air conditioning, electricity, Wi-Fi, and go talk to somebody who lost every physical thing on planet Earth so that you can get a reset and understand exactly who Elohim is and exactly who you are because all the things you're fighting about don't really matter. They don't really matter. And so I wish that more people would do more. And me personally, I'm incapable of doing less. My wife would love it if I did. But here we are. Well, doing more, man. This is the opportunity for some people, hopefully out there, to do something. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I guess that's it. Would you like to add anything else? I, I, want, I want to let you get back to work. No, brother. I, dude, I appreciate you so much. Thank you for everything that you've done for me, everything that you've done for Grindstone and Caleb House, everything that you've done for the community at large. Again, I, I will be one of your biggest cheerleaders. Um, I don't think you get enough credit for allowing the spirit to work through you. You're an excellent conduit. I know you're not the living water. I know you're just a pipe, but nobody ever says thank you to the pipes. And so I'm thanking you for being a pipe because you're a damn good pipe, brother. And, uh... I appreciate you. Thank you, Bear. I appreciate you too. And it sounds like a bunch more people in Tennessee are about to. <laughs> <laughs> Bless you, brother. All right. See you, man.